Good evening, everyone. Am I showing up? All right, I have no idea if I'm on screen or not. So uh, hopefully I am. Uh, good evening, um, I'm uh, James Beebe. I'm the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs here at uh, Keene State College. And uh, welcome everyone to this evening's event. Uh, the President Treadwell sends her regrets. She's unable to join us this evening and she asked me to step in in for her, but I'm really happy to do this. Uh, I think we've got a very good evening uh, in store here for you. And I just want to introduce you to the event itself. Uh, and this is called the Saul O. Sador Memorial Foundation Lecture. Uh, this was set, uh, founded by uh, the Sador series, our named in the memory of, of uh, Mr. Sador. He was born in New York City in 1907, the son of immigrants. He became involved in the knitting industry in New York in 1931 and moved his business to Manchester, New Hampshire in 1940, where it became known as the Brookshire uh, Knitting Mills and later as Pandora. Um, he died in 1964 after leaving the company in a major growth effort that brought employment in Manchester to more than 600 people. Sador's success was based on the theory that following ethical principles is the only sure way to build a business and provide security for its employees. He pioneered a profit sharing uh, plan, instituted a pension plan, was the first in New Hampshire to employ an industrial psychologist, ensure, ensured hospitalization benefits for his employees and founded a scholarship loan fund to send employees' children to college. He was a member of the New Hampshire Advisory Committee to the US Commission on Civil Rights and was a driving force for the ideals of humanity and brotherhood in Manchester, the state of New Hampshire and the nation. The foundation in the series has been established to support campus presentations by speakers on emerging ideas and to enhance faculty efforts to challenge students and the wider community to provide, uh, to, to participate, excuse me, in dialogue around original, provocative and sometimes controversial issues facing society. Today is also Constitution Day. So tonight's lecture also commemorates Constitution Day. On September the 17th, 1787, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention met for the last time to sign the document that they have created. 39 men signed the US Constitution, recognizing all who were born in the US or by naturalization have become citizens. So on Constitution Day, we also celebrate Citizenship Day, a holiday meant to honor the privileges and responsibilities of US citizenship for both native born and naturalized citizens. And as a naturalized citizen myself, I can assure you how important the Constitution is to all naturalized citizens and hopefully to all American citizens, all native born American citizens. Tonight's lecture fulfills the legacy of an active citizen and the son of immigrants to learn and engage in thoughtful discussion of the founding document of the United States. And just as an aside, I think Constitution Day is a very important moment for us to reflect on what it means to be a citizen of the United States, particularly at a time where you hear that people are divided over many different issues in life. It's important that we have the respect for the Constitution, the respect for civil engagement, and to be active citizens in the life of our community, whether it is local, state, regional, or national. So I'm really pleased that we're having this lecture this evening. So it's my pleasure now to introduce you to Dr. Pat Dolans, Professor of, of Economics at Keene State College, a long time dedicated faculty member with the American Democracy Project and with Constitution Day, who will introduce our speaker for this evening. Pat, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Beebe. We're in for a real treat tonight uh, to we get to hear from my friend and, and civic engagement colleague, Dr. Leah Murray. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Murray before I, I turn, uh, turn the floor over to her. Uh, she's quite the, the civic engagement rock star on the national stage, as, as you'll hear. For Dr. Uh, for Dr. Murray, civic engagement is a passion that she shares with her students, her university, her community, but on a national stage as well. Dr. Murray earned her PhD in political science at the University of Albany, 
In 2002, she joined Weber State University's Department of Political Science and Philosophy. Weber State's located in Ogden, Utah, if you're not familiar. And at Weber State, she has taught a broad range of, and continues to teach a broad range of courses, including political behavior, identity politics, and the American presidency. Dr. Murray is the Brady Presidential Distinguished Professor in the Department of Political Science and Philosophy at Weber State, and she was also recognized as the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences Endowed Professor for 2017 to 2020. Committed to deepening political participation on campus, Dr. Murray helped launch and coordinate the American Democracy Project on her campus in 2004 in the early stages of this national initiative. It's an initiative that now includes hundreds of state colleges and, and universities. And under her direction, her students have been able to bring a full slate of national, state, and local experts to discuss community issues of concern. She's also served in a leadership role as the ADP National Steering Committee Chair. Dr. Murray directs Weber State University's Constitution Week events and is part of a collaboration that conducts election day polling and voter registration outreach both on and off campus. She currently serves as the academic director of the Walker Institute of Politics and Public Service, and in that role, co-chairs the Political Engagement Coalition, as well as advising her campus's American Democracy Project team. To encourage lifelong engagement, Dr. Murray helped to create Weber State University's Civitas program, a specific designation for civically engaged scholars. Students who demonstrate distinction in four areas of civic engagement earn the phrase, non sibi sed civitas, not for self, for community. And this shows up on their transcripts, an idea that she's presented at several regional and national conferences. A highly sought after presenter and commentator, Dr. Murray has made many appearances on local television and radio programs in Utah and shared her passion and understanding of democracy and the political process for various community groups. Her scholarship includes two books, American National Government and Politics and Popular Culture, and she's authored an additional seven book chapters. Dr. Murray accepts the responsibility to educate students to become and stay active, informed civil, civil participants in the political and electoral process in order to prepare them to emerge as future leaders. I'd like to introduce Dr. Leah Murray. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Um, first, let me just say to you, if you have a question, please put your question into the Q&A. That just helps us as panelists in a webinar um, actually manage those questions coming in. And second, let me just say, I love the idea of being introduced as a civic engagement um, scholar. It's my passion. It's what I work on and think about a lot as we pause to reflect on the Constitution on Constitution Day. Um, there's a famous great story where a woman accosts Benjamin Franklin one day while he is leaving the Constitutional Convention. And she says, you know, hey, Dr. Franklin, what are you building for us, a republic? And he says, yes, madam, if you can keep it. Um, and so while I think it's very important um, to pause to think about our Constitution, I also want to note that our founding fathers would have asked us all to play a role, right? So this is um, an active citizenship, an active um, engagement in what we're doing. So I like, um, thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Dr. Beebe, for um, kind of weaving that for me as you were introducing, help me kind of frame what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to chat about the Bill of Rights to the Constitution. Um, you can think about this country as having three founding documents. Um, one is the Declaration of Independence, one is the United States Constitution, and one is the Bill of Rights. And today as we celebrate um, Constitution Day, which was Friday, I had cake, I hope you all had cake um, to celebrate the birthday. Um, but as we think about it, we're going to talk about this one piece of the document that gets added afterwards. Um, and I'm just going to tell you a story of how the Bill of Rights came to be, why I think it demonstrates, um, you know, how this country works. Um, and in fact, I think we could see ourselves a little bit today in what we saw happening um, in 1787 when we do talk about this. So, um, so we're gonna kind of tell this story and then pivot to what the Bill of Rights is doing and how important a role it plays in our government as well and in our country and in our nation. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about the United States Constitution. 
when I teach this to my students, this document was not delivered, you know, like Moses coming down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, right? So it was not the case that people went, whoa, here is the Constitution. And the American people said, thank you, right? Um, it was very controversial. People were very polarized over whether this was a good document, whether they should have done it, whether they were allowed to do it. Um, there's a reason those delegates were operating in secret <laughs> when they talked for the entire summer of 1787 to build this document. Um, so on September 17th, they sign it. And as Dr. Beebe said, 39 men signed the document, which means 30% of the original delegates refused to sign. So right out of the gate, you've got a major chunk of men who actually were there for all the debates, who today would be considered founding fathers who were refusing to sign. We have five states where no more than two people from the state actually signed it. Um, and we've got Rhode Island refusing to sign, New York officially refused to sign, except that Alexander Hamilton stayed and um, signed anyway. Um, so he just did that for New York, but technically he wasn't supposed to. Again, so very controversial. On September 20th, George Washington writes a note to the Continental Congress, and he says to the, to the Congress, this is the report of the Constitutional Convention, um, and this is what we've got. This is this document, the Constitution. The Continental Congress is not super impressed by the document, and in fact, the founders were worried that they might even stymie it right out of the gate. But it's hard in 1787 to receive a letter from George Washington who asks you to send this document along the states and then not do that. So they answer the call and they send it out to a convention of delegates chosen in each state by September 28th. The thing is, why do nations write constitutions, right? So why is it the case that we are celebrating Constitution Day? And the reason why nations write constitutions is they have high hopes. They've got an idea for what they can change about the world. They have an idea for what they can build and make things better going forward. So even though 30% of the founding fathers who were there and um, the Continental Congress was not really impressed <laughs> enough to sign it or think it was a great document, it had really captured the high hopes of the nation. Um, and part of the reason why it captures the high hopes of the nation is this idea of a natural rights foundation. Um, if we think about our country, and I love telling this story, if we were to do like a word cloud in America and you kind of asked Americans, what's the most important word? Rights would be huge. Like it would be the biggest word cloud for Americans. Um, and pretty much we have this idea of natural rights that we trace back to John Locke and his influence over the way that we thought about things as we begin to fight the Revolutionary War. So I told you there was the first major document at our founding is the Declaration of Independence. And right in the Declaration is these self-evident truths. These are not axioms, they are truths to be believed. Um, this natural rights philosophy. And again, and so when we think about higher education, these founding fathers were attending Harvard, Yale, Princeton, right? And they're talking about issues of the day, the way that we talk about issues of the day when we are in higher education. And John Locke is someone they would have been reading. So they are thinking about what it means to have a natural rights republic. What does that look like? What does it mean when you make people free? Um, and it, it's interesting, right? Just kind of thinking about how we're going to make change what we're doing with Britain and what that's going to look like going forward. All right, so let's just kind of tell this story really quickly. You fight the Revolutionary War, against all odds you win, and now you've got a question you need to answer because what you have done is dissolved the government, which is what Locke said you had to do, right? So if we think that the government has abused our rights or is not protecting our rights, then it's our job as active citizens to dissolve it and start over. Um, so, but then there's a question. Um, most people are doing okay from, you know, in the 1780s, but it's not perfect. And there definitely is a general feeling that the American idea, the American experience, the American Republic is in peril. 
they're worried um, about what's happening. And there's a number of different things that are going on. There's millions of acres of land um, that are being claimed by a number of different states and we gotta figure out where they go. Um, questions like really theoretical questions. When we win the Revolutionary War, are we now in a state of nature? And if we are in a state of nature, who are we in a state of nature with? So when we dissolved our ties with Great Britain, do we still exist as political societies in America? So if we say um, we are back in a state of nature, um, then any law or understanding of what had happened previous to us winning that war is gone, right? And so how we were going to settle, what to do with those acres of land, where sovereignty went um, when we decided not to listen to King George anymore, who owned what property, um, you know, tobacco planters owed British merchants $10 million, but if you're now in a state of nature, who requires them to pay off those debts? Do you pay off those debts? So however you answer the question as to how we dissolve this and whether we are in a state of nature, property rights are on very slippery ground. So even though people are kind of doing okay, there's a sense of concern as to, are we in a state of nature? If we are, how does that work? How do we answer these questions? What are we supposed to do? And quite frankly, the Articles of Confederation, which is the government we had established to fight and win the war, was not up to that challenge. So that Continental Congress, when it gets the report from Washington, even though it's not super impressed, it doesn't have a lot to offer by the way of stability or people feeling good about what's happening. And so all these questions are in play. So it's kind of fun because it means that, right, the country's really thinking about answering this question of if we dissolve this government, do we dissolve the social contract? And how, if the social contract is dissolved, what are we supposed to do? And if property rights are in trouble, if they are on very slippery ground, then how do we secure them? All right, so how do we figure out how to do this? And then add to this, the American people regarded all governments with suspicion, right? So anything you're adding or creating is something new, they are going to have a problem with. Um, in the middle of all of this, Thomas Jefferson argues that we're going to get rid of primogeniture, which means property rights, which might have been tied to like hereditary um, expectations kind of goes away. If you were someone who was a loyalist, you lost all of your property. If you were someone who was a loyalist, the people who fought for the revolution did not have to pay debts to you. Um, I mean, like it's somewhat depending on who you were, what was going on with your property was in flux, right? And there was questions about this. So there's some major names at the time who are thinking about how to answer this question. James Madison here in the middle, um, who we consider the father of our constitution and definitely is the father of the Bill of Rights in that he's the author of the original draft of both of these documents. Madison says, the dissolution of the charter with Britain did not break the social compact between the American people. So the answer to the question of whether we are in a state of nature um, is no. No American was in a state of nature with another American. So the people existed before the government is created. Um, and what's kind of interesting is Madison is asserting this common bond without a common authority, right? So there's a collective consciousness. There's something kind of there um, that it's about being an American that doesn't necessarily see need a colonial charter. Thomas Jefferson here on the right basically argues that it's, um, he, you know, he's so much fun. So you've got to destroy the old regime to build progress. Um, Thomas Jefferson is the man who's going to argue we should have a war every 30 years um, and just start over. And that progress happens because of people. And any government that we build is just gonna support um, what are the natural rights, um, what is the natural um, assertion of rights by American individuals. Um, the document you know him for is the Declaration of Independence. And he asserts this kind of natural rights argument early and it pulls a thread through any conversation that's going on at this time. Alexander Hamilton over here on my left um, basically says it's not people who causes progress, um, people cause problems, right? So Hamilton 
Milton's got more of a pessimistic view of the true nature of humankind and believes that it's institutions that will protect, right? So, but all of their answers are going to say, um, we may have dissolved our relationship with the British government and we no longer are in a state of um, authority with them, but our individual rights now need to be protected. Property rights need to be secured. Um, and then it's just really a question of how we're going to do that. So the Declaration of Independence calls the American people one people. The Declaration of Independence uses the phrase, the United States, uses that term, the United States of America, um, and refers to the colonies as a plural, free and independent states. The peace treaty with England acknowledges that the United States are free, um, that they are sovereign and that they are independent. And so that's kind of where we're at when the founding fathers show up to have a constitutional conversation and they design a government and they send it out to the American people via the Continental Congress um, through to get into a process called ratification. But I kind of set up this argument about natural rights for you so you understand what the American people were thinking, right? Like what, what they would be thinking about as this document comes out to them and they're going to make decisions about what it's going to look like next. Okay, so ratification is not easy. Um, again, this is not Moses coming down and the American people saying, thank you so much for showing up with this for us, right? Ratification was a political fight. So what's kind of interesting, and so you can look here, this is the order of ratification from left to right. Delaware is the first one, Rhode Island is the last one. If a state was fast in calling its elections for delegates, they won majorities for ratification very quickly. And here's the fun thing, lest you think the American people look very different today, they don't. <laughs> Support for the United States Constitution was concentrated in cities and towns along the coast, and the opposition to the Constitution um, were scattered in rural areas. So just like we see today where there's kind of a division um, in the way that we look at things and think about things from our coast to our more rural areas, that was true at the time of ratifying this document. So think about what it is, think about 1787, and think about if I call elections quickly, <laughs> like if you live in the cities, it's gonna be faster and easier for you to get there. So if the election dates are set quickly, as we see in these first five states, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, Connecticut, um, they move really quickly and the opposition can't really mobilize. So they cannot get delegates who are in opposition to the conventions um, to make the argument. When we get to Massachusetts, this winning trail of ratifying the document fails. Uh, it doesn't fail, it stalls. I wanna say it slows down. So what happens, and I gotta be clear about this, Massachusetts is a very important state. New York is a very important state. Virginia is a very important state. New Hampshire is gonna be important for a whole other reason. <laughs> but in this conversation, these three states matter. They are big, they're wealthy, they're in the middle of the country geographically. If any of the three of them say, no, we've got a problem, okay? So when it gets to Massachusetts, that this is the moment that the anti-federalists are able to mount some serious opposition becomes a problem and becomes an issue. Um, so people who were along the coasts, who were elected to the convention from Massachusetts um, tended to be ratifiers, they tend to be pro-ratification. The people who were elected to the convention in Massachusetts who were against ratification for, were from the West. So there's an interesting thing that happens is that um, the best kind of speakers in Massachusetts don't get elected if they were in opposition to the document because those people were in the cities along the coast and they don't get chosen because those areas were much more pro-ratification. So when you go into the convention, the anti-ratification doesn't have, you know, like the gravitas, doesn't have the big names to make the argument. Um, and then what happens is the pro-ratification speakers end up making all of the arguments. So in the Massachusetts ratification, the ratifying convention, 
The pro-ratification speakers or the Federalists do the talking for the anti-Federalists. So they make the argument for them and then they refute it. It's kind of an interesting thing to read as they're, you can imagine Republicans making the argument to tax the wealthy and then refuting it in that debate. So that's an interesting thing going on in Massachusetts. Um, they know that even though the best speakers are pro-ratification, the majority of delegates were anti-ratification. And they do kind of an early version of a filibuster. So what they say is, if we vote quickly, we will not pass it. So Massachusetts would probably fail the Constitution and the would not be ratified. So what they do is the pro-ratification speakers ask for a clause by clause, paragraph by paragraph deliberation to just draw it out, okay? So they're just slowing everything down. Rule in politics is this, if you won, stop talking. If you're losing, keep talking, right? So these um, members of this convention delegation are just slowing everything down. Um, what happens is, some naughty things, uh, you know, some hijinks ensued. Um, creditors were pressuring debtors to ratify. People will, so people who are delegates from the west part of Massachusetts who had traveled to the convention ratifying, <laughs> ratifying convention, were told they wouldn't get the money to travel home if they didn't say yes. So there's like some naughty pressure being put on. Um, and then there's this interesting thing that happens. John Hancock and Samuel Adams both went in as agnostic, right? They don't go in as anti or pro um, ratification. Paul Revere um, gets a petition from 400 tradesmen demanding that he support ratification who were in his district. So he's kind of paying attention to that. Um, and Samuel Adams um, basically get some pressure as well. And so the two of them who are kind of big names in Massachusetts, you have all heard those names, um, they move, Hancock is the person who moves to assent to and ratify the said constitution. And Han, or excuse me, Adams is the seconder of that motion. So now you've got John Hancock like moving to do this and Adams seconding it, makes it a little bit harder to say no. But here's the deal, and this is where the Bill of Rights comes into the story. Massachusetts says, you can ratify, and we'll be cool with this document, but we, and this is what Hancock says, I give my assent to the Constitution in full confidence that the amendments proposed will soon become a part of the Constitution. So Massachusetts sends along a yes, we're going to ratify, with an original draft of a Bill of Rights. Um, most of it's about state powers. Um, it's about prohibiting monopolies. It's about having grand juries do an indicting. It's about limiting federal courts, which was something they were worried about. There's nothing in there that's like First Amendment, nothing on freedom of speech, religions, um, press, right? Just about state powers and some of these very particular ones. So what's going to happen is they give begrudging acceptance, but not a condition. So this is kind of important. So they're demanding a Bill of Rights but they're doing it with full confidence it will happen, not on the condition that it does happen. So Massachusetts is a yes. That is a huge move, right? So Massachusetts being one of the big, wealthy middle states, um, geographically middle states, like moving in that direction um, makes it now more interesting in Virginia and New York. Virginia, God bless them, line themselves up in an effort to be the ninth state that would ratify. So they set up their convention in a way so that they could be number nine. After Massachusetts, Maryland, and South Carolina are going to ratify, and those are pretty large margins. So now you've got eight states, and we're looking for the ninth state. Virginia is led, its ratifying convention is led by Patrick Henry, who is a, an anti-ratifier. Um, and there's an interesting thing that happens. I just love this story. Patrick Henry, J Patrick Henry gerrymanders James Madison's district before the word is even a word, meaning he drew Madison's district in such a way so that when he was elected to Congress, many people in his district were pro Bill of Rights and had been anti Federalist. So that when Madison runs for office, he actually has to say, I promise to push through a Bill of Rights. So it's an early use of redistricting to try to guarantee a political outcome. So in Virginia, what Virginia is really worried about is navigation laws. They're really worried about keeping the Mississippi open. And the big argument there is whether states should have the power to protect navigation on the Mississippi or whether the central government should be doing it. Um, 
and that's you know just a very state interested fight that they have. Patrick Henry is not looking to reject the Constitution necessarily out of hand, but is looking to require amendments as a condition. So notice the difference, right? Hancock says, we're going to say yes, full confidence, you'll give us a Bill of Rights. Patrick Henry wants to say, we want you to give it to us. That's the condition. So we will say yes once you actually give us a Bill of Rights. And then they propose a second constitutional convention. And this is when things get interesting, like if they had phones and they were able to email or call each other, right? So Virginia's governor sends a letter to New York's governor and basically says, what if you go in with us and we will call for a second constitutional convention because this document's not really what we want. Let's just start over. Um, but it doesn't, the letter doesn't get there in time. Um, and so the deal kind of is, had it gotten there early enough, New York probably would have agreed. And then we're having a whole different conversation about when Constitution Day is as we're talking right now. Um, New York says eventually, very slowly, so Virginia just keeps chatting. Um, New York writes back and says, yeah, we could join with you on that. We'll call for a second constitutional convention. But the governor delays showing it to the legislature so they don't get it. And then the convention doesn't see it until the day of the ratification vote. And remember, Virginia thinks it's gonna be ninth, right? So they're gonna be the state that ratifies with conditions maybe, they're gonna ratify this thing. They're gonna be the ninth state. They're gonna cause um, the country to get created. And it's a circus, like that day is just a big party. And literally the letter from New York that says we would go in with you on a second constitutional convention sits on the table up front and nobody looks at it. Um, so it's kind of an interesting, you know, um, moment in history where maybe a phone call <laughs> like would have changed the course of history. Um, but that letter comes in and they don't really pay attention to it. So Virginia ratifies. Um, but you all know that New Hampshire got there first, right? So New Hampshire is going to ratify four days before Virginia. They don't realize in Virginia that New Hampshire already has ratified. So they were excited to be the 10th state, um, but they don't get it done. Um, and in New Hampshire, it's ratified with a 10 vote margin. In Virginia, it's ratified with a 10 vote margin. And Patrick Henry says, my head, my hand, and my heart shall be at liberty to remove the defects of the system in a constitutional way. So let me just back up a little bit. He doesn't win the argument to get the Bill of Rights in as a condition, okay? So they're gonna ratify with the expectation and with a letter that says we should have a second constitutional convention, and here's a draft of amendments we think that you should think about. Now we turn to New York. So what's gonna happen in New York is New York opens while Virginia is still in session. And New York, I don't know how much you know about New York state politics, but this looks very similar <laughs> to what you would see in New York state today. Upstate was very anti-ratification. New York City was very pro-ratification, um, but New York's got some big guns, right? So. Governor George Clinton, very popular upstate, and he is leading the anti-federalist charge. From New York City is our very favorite founding father, Alexander Hamilton, who is leading the ratification charge. Um, and Hamilton's good, okay? So what Hamilton does basically is he says, here's the deal, Governor Clinton should be the president of our convention. He's a very honored person, he's the governor, we respect him. So what he does in this beautiful move is like, looks like he respects the other side, looks like he's being bipartisan and takes Clinton off the floor for debate because if you are the chair, you are not speaking. So he takes out of this argument, out of the debates in New York, one of their best speakers who would be anti-ratification. He also does his own version of a filibuster and he basically says, I need to hear from Virginia or New Hampshire. So the argument kind of is if one of them ratify, that's nine states and it's a fait accompli. And then the pitch to New York is the country's a go. It's a yes, so why don't we join in with what's happening? Um, so he does a document, not paragraph by paragraph, but line by line. They're gonna read it, they're gonna look at it, they're going to think about it. Anti-Federalists have a majority. Um, so if you were just voting up down on the constitution, the Anti-Federalists would win, but the Anti-Federalists in New York have a mixed position. <clears throat> so some of them say no, reject outright. And some of them say no, or excuse me, ratify with conditions. So their argument looking more similar to Massachusetts and Virginia. 
Um, so they actually ask, and Hamilton writes a letter to Madison to ask him, do you think we could ratify with a requirement to have a new convention in four years? And Madison says, you could do that, but then you won't be a full and equal member. Right? So you will not be a member in good standing in the new um, government. And then New Hampshire comes in and um, Virginia comes in. And so now New York is in the middle of a country that exists that has started. They ratify with three vote margin. And they ratify with the same language as Massachusetts with the confidence that the amendments will be added. They also send out a circular letter to the rest of the governors of the states demanding um, a second constitutional convention as part of what's going on. Madison and Washington get a little angry with Hamilton for doing that. Hamilton signs on to that letter. Hamilton basically says, uh, unconditional ratification was better than nothing. And if I have to do this letter to get the unconditional ratification in the state of New York, I'm gonna good, I'm, I'm gonna do it. Like that's, that's a positive, I'm gonna want to do that. But what I need you to note is that at every single point of this, states are ratifying by very small margins. Now I want you also look here, New York's the last one. North Carolina is gonna be a year later and Rhode Island's gonna be two years later. So those two states never ratify um, before the country gets started. And all of the states are demanding changes. And the changes that we think about and that we talk about are the Bill of Rights. Alexander Hamilton believes the task of the new government is to unify the country, not super worried about answering the promises made to anti-federalists, he feels the constitution is a license to govern. Um, and so we're good to go. We don't really need to talk about a bill of rights any further. Let's just start unifying the country. But Madison's got a different answer to this. Madison agrees with Hamilton that there's no need for a bill of rights. And if you are someone who's ever read the Federalist Papers, you'll see them arguing like, why do you need a Bill of Rights? The government, you know, the, Cong the Constitution doesn't allow anything bad to happen. And right, like, this is not an issue. And there's no power here to disregard rights. So why would we do this? Um, and then some more like specific reasons why we're going to be worried about it. But Madison understands that a majority of the people might be okay with the new Constitution but they're not really loving it, right? So they're not really feeling it. So Madison says, we ought not to disregard their inclination, but on principles of amity and moderation, conform to their wishes and expressly declare the rights of mankind secured under this constitution. Okay, so what Madison is going to argue is we're gonna push this thing because that is how we get everyone on the same page. So I got, you know, like, so it's close, right? The ratification's close, 10 votes, three votes, 10 votes, right? Really close. Um, and what I have to do is get these people on board with me. Madison is concerned about reverence. Um, if people are going to revere the document, they need to have something in there that they love. So unlike Hamilton, who thinks the institutions are gonna do the trick, Madison's like, we need something more. Um, so, and let's just kind of build the context. So the anti-federalists who are powerful, popular, politically famous men are agitating for a bill of rights the whole time. So they're con talking about it constantly. Second, James Madison, like I told you before, has been redistricted to have a lot of anti-federalists in his district to get elected to Congress. He had to promise to do a bill of rights. Third, Madison's pretty good friends with Thomas Jefferson and Jefferson says, let me add that a Bill of Rights is what the people are entitled to against every government on earth. So, right, so Madison's kind of like, I got to answer that. So Jefferson wants me to do a Bill of Rights. My district has been districted in such a way that I had to promise them a Bill of Rights. These powerful men are never going to stop talking about it um, unless we push something through. All right, so on June 8th, 1789, James Madison stands up in Congress and pushes through a Bill of Rights, where he introduces a Bill of Rights. Um, again, the context at this time is Virginia's demanding a second convention because they finally figured out what that letter from New York was saying. Um, New York is still demanding because of their circular letter to have a second constitutional convention. 
members of Congress are like, are you kidding? You know, all we need to do right now is like, I don't know, build a bureaucracy and settle all the problems that we had. And we actually need to be governing. The last thing we need to be worried about is writing amendments and thinking about this. And Madison says, to make the constitution as acceptable to the whole people of the United States, as it has been found acceptable to a majority of them, we need to write these amendments. Now, the cool thing that Madison's got for this is one, the language is in every single one of his um, proposed amendments is in addition to rather than an amendment of, and he wants to slide it into article one, section nine between clauses three and four. I'm like 100% sure you all had the constitution memorized. And so I'm sure you know exactly where that is. But basically that's the denied powers. Congress shall not do habeas corpus and Congress shall not do ex post facto. So after those, right, then we're gonna have Congress shall not make any law infringing the freedom of speech. And basically the language otherwise is very similar. First, second, fourth, eighth amendments are in there. Parts of the fifth and the sixth amendment are in there and they're gonna be slid into the document. Um, so one, he never concedes that you need to change it. <laughs> like, so if I put it in there, it's just additions. And then two, it's a really cool moment um, in our document where it's a negative imperative. The language is Congress shall not. It is not a grant of rights. It's not saying the people have the right to speech. Right, it is saying the government cannot deny the right to speech. So that negative imperative is a really powerful language move, right? Like the way that we're going to think about this. Um, on that day, Congress said nothing. They didn't even acknowledge it. Not a single person commented on the content of the Bill of Rights. They just voted on procedure, whether it should go into a committee or whether they should take it up as a committee of the whole. So in Congress, not really landing kind of cool. But out in the world, the newspapers were publishing it. The public were reacting to it. Madison is getting letters about what a brilliant idea it is and that the proposal is excellent. Um, and so a month later, Madison begs Congress, please like take this up. So Congress says, fine, like we'll deal with it. And they refer it to something called the Committee of 11. The next week, the Committee of 11 returns it um, to the floor. And basically they're gonna send back it, it's the same language, okay? So Madison's won the argument in the committee. Um, they're gonna basically just kind of copy edit. They're gonna revise it a little bit. And on August 19th, 1789, the House starts talking about the proposal, which is 12 amendments. Um, the first two are never gonna get ratified right out of the gate. Um, and the first two amendments are basically, um, uh, yeah, the compensation, which is gonna be the 27th amendment eventually. Um, and um, how we do districts and how many people are going to be in districts. So what's kind of cool is it's an accident in history that the opening to the Bill of Rights says Congress shall make no law and then off it goes, right? So it's gonna reflect this negative imperative. It is a taking away of power from the government um, which acknowledges the natural rights of the American people. Again, that thread we pull through from the declaration. Madison also had wanted to revise the preamble. He gives up on that. He also, like I told you, wanted to weave this into the Constitution, Article 1, Section 9, and he gives up on that. And he basically says, all right, like I've changed my mind. He writes a letter to a state legislator explaining it. Having a Bill of Rights is not a problem. Many states were ratifying with the expectation of the amendments forthcoming. Um, the only way this is going to work and people are going to revere this document is if we do this. Um, Anti-Federalists in Congress were going to introduce their own crazy set, <laughs> like so I had to move before their crazy came in. Um, the adoption of the amendments would help kill the opposition to the Constitution everywhere. Public opinion is with the amendments. And then remember, um, it is the case that North Carolina hadn't ratified. Once these amendments pass, North Carolina does, right? So we actually pick up another state. When they put forth their amendments, so the 12 amendments come into the House, South Carolina stands up and introduces 17 of their own, right? <laughs> um, and so this quote here is from one of the members of the committee, Representative Vining, who says, you are insinuating a reflection upon the committee for not reporting all the amendments proposed by some of the state conventions. Because remember, the states were sending, we're gonna say yes, and here's a list of things you should change. But some of them contradicted each other some of them were seen as being superfluous. Some of them were seen as being dangerous. 
Many of them were a problem. And so the state recommendations were relatively ignored. Um, the South Carolina amendments that they proposed basically were like transfer all the power back to the states of, um, and get it out of the hands of the national government, which would have negated the entire process, right? So off it goes. Um, the first two, like I said, do not get ratified. So these are the 10 that we have. <clears throat> and we call them a Bill of Rights. And they are the third freedom charter in this country, right? They are the other place where you can guarantee that you as an individual are going to be protected. The interesting thing about ratification here is for the most part, the Bill of Rights was not like, this was not special. My favorite story actually comes out of New Hampshire where the New Hampshire governor says to the state, um, we've got some issues with a lighthouse and there's like a prison we got to build and we got to talk about like taxes. Oh, and then by the way, here's this Bill of Rights, you should ratify it, right? So it comes in like at the end of this speech um, in New Hampshire, right? Just do this. All the debates in the states on the ratification echo what we'd heard in Congress. Um, and I'll do a couple of explanations of those in just a second. We'll do a little couple of deep dives. And March 1st, 1792, they are all ratified. So the third charter of the United States doesn't get a fanfare, doesn't get a parade. We don't light any firecrackers for that one. No one takes March 1st off to think about it. But the Bill of Rights is such an important part of what makes Constitution Day possible because without the Bill of Rights, it went, would not have gone. All right, so let's talk about a couple of these and then I'll open it up to whatever questions maybe came in. The First Amendment's probably the most famous. Most Americans can name the First Amendment and name a few of these rights that you get. And what's kind of interesting too, if you think about how Madison was right, if you ask Americans what their rights are, they never say habeas corpus, right? They never say, I have the right to vote for my house member. They always will say free speech or the right to bear arms. They're always gonna list things out of the Bill of Rights because what we revere and what we love are in this document. The First Amendment, the debates around this in Congress are interesting. Um, the religion conversations, uh, very revealing. Um, the, the people in both the states and the Congress are like, what you're writing here is gonna say that Jewish people get rights. They were very worried about um, Jewish people having rights. By the way, seven states are not going to allow Jewish people to vote right out of the gate. So they deal with it <laughs> by preventing their voting rights. Um, but they basically get really clear. And it's a great quote um, from Ben Franklin. All of this works if you're on the team that is the good team, but if you're on the other team, it's a problem. So we're just gonna protect all of the religions, right? We're just gonna make sure, even if we disagree with what they're doing, we're gonna protect it. The debate around petition was actually about instructing representatives. What is the role of public opinion for elected representatives? It could inform any conversation we're having today. Um, what's really interesting is not a single discussion in Congress about the freedom of speech or the freedom of the press, it just passes. It just passes. So no one like First Amendment law, freedom of speech is like hundreds of years of law, constitutional law, um, freedom of the press, hundreds of years of constitutional law and the founders, the original Congress who write it don't debate it. So we actually don't know what they meant. Um, at one point, Jefferson's gonna write a letter to tell them how they could have written it better because <laughs> he thinks it could have been written better, um, but it doesn't go and this is what we get. The other thing that's kind of interesting too on the First Amendment was it used to be Congress shall make no law um, respecting people's conscience. Um, and conscience gets taken out because there's a lengthy discussion about what conscience is and how would you know and is it properly informed and what would that look like? Um, but again, no discussion around speech, no discussion around press. And we, so our authors are completely silent as to what that might mean. Second Amendment's a pretty uh, sexy amendment in our history. Um, the original language for this was a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people being the best security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, but no person religiously scrupulous shall be compelled to bear arms. So you'll note what words get left out, right? So when we look at the second amendment, there's phrases that get taken out as a result of the debate. So what's interesting here is the second amendment conversation is about having state militias. And the argument is, how do you protect yourself? Um, literally, they'll say, 
to prevent the establishment of a standing army, okay, a standing army is the bane of liberty, the states have to have militias. But the original clause says no person religiously scrupulous shall be compelled to bear arms. And then the argument is, but what's the problem, right? Like, uh, if I can't draft you, there might not be enough people to be in the militia. And then how am I going to defend against a national military if they create a standing army? Um, how do we know if you mean it? It's a whole conversation about religious exemptions, um, which again could inform conversations we're having today. Lengthy discussion around what religiously scrupulous means. Um, if you don't require people who are religiously scrupulous to serve, then you can't depend on your militia. Um, the expectation that people would lie about their religious exemptions. Um, not a single conversation about whether it means personal private use of arms. So as a result of our constitutional law, we now say that this amendment gives an individual the right to bear arms for personal use, hunting, um, self-defense. But at the time that this is written, they never discussed private use, not a single time. It is all about whether you can draft people into the militia, bear arms absolutely meant serving in the militia of the states throughout the entire debate. And the big concern that they had was the states would continue to have a militia to protect them from a federal government military. Okay. The other one I thought we could look at real quick is the 10th Amendment. And the 10th Amendment, um, the original language is the powers not expressly delegated. And then it goes through everything you see here. The power is not expressly delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the, United, to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, and that's where it ended. So the debate here um, was a conversation about what powers the states should get. It is not an assertion of confederacy. So they are not talking about giving the states more powers. If they had wanted to do that, they would have picked up the South Carolina um, choice and like ran with that. The 10th Amendment is about federalism and how we have that argument. Um, and my favorite part in the debate, so the original language says the power is not expressly delegated. And Madison literally says like, what does expressly even mean? Are you suggesting that the constitution descend into the minutia of policy? Like, why would you do that? That is not a good idea. And then they're a little worried about state power. So the document that we get has at the end of it to the people. So they add to the states or to the people. So any powers not get given by article one, section eight to the United States nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states or to the people. Um, so it's a, not a state's rights document necessarily, although um, over time it has been used to defend the state's rights to do things. Really, it's a conversation around where do powers live if we didn't list them here? One of the big issues for the founders on the Bill of Rights was this might look like an exhaustive list, right? So people are gonna think it's just speech and guns and like no quartering of soldiers and you know your Miranda rights and that's it. And they wanna make sure that people understand that anything we didn't list here is reserved to the people. And then the 10th amendment is gonna reserve it to the states, right? So they're thinking about how to manage that. But the other super cool thing that happens when they add to the people at the end of this is that our document starts with that po very powerful negative affirmative, right? Excuse me, negative um, imperative. Congress shall make no. And then there's a list. And at the end, it's to the people. So to a certain extent, I want to end and say that the Bill of Rights is the people's document. Okay, these are the three charters of government. Um, these are the three charters of freedom. That's the phrase that the um, United States National Archives uses when they describe these charters. Um, and they talk about these three documents in the United States, the Declaration of Independence is really important um, and the Constitution is very important. And the Bill of Rights is as important, right? It is the people's article. Um, it takes the Declaration and the expectations of natural rights that we wrote out in the Declaration and fuses it back into um, our constitutional document, giving us an understanding of what conscience might be. 
Um, this is the idea of our political soul, right? So the Bill of Rights is what is America? And when you list it out, we are people who care about being able to speak. We are people who care about people being able to be whatever religion they want, even if we disagree with them. We are people who care about having courage and defending, right? When we think about the conversations around the militia, we're people who worry about the silences and where does the power go if the document is actually silent. Um, so thank you very much. That is my conversation about the Bill of Rights and I'll take any questions you all have. Thank you, Leah. Um, this was a wonderful way to start um, our evening. Um, Leah, um, I first before we get into the Q&A and I ask folks to put things into the chat and I will um, read them to Leah for you um, or into the Q&A box. I'm sorry, not the chat. Um, I want to take a moment and thank our teams here at Keene State College, our marketing team and our team from our events office who helped produce tonight's event, specifically Misty Kennedy, um, who helped us with all the fun pieces with Zoom here. So if you have any questions, go ahead to put them in the Q&A. Um, Leah, I know when you and I first um, started to think about this lecture, one of the pieces that I was, uh, I kind of went, oh, right, there's minutes to these meetings, right? Right, right. Um, and so could you help us understand, like, Obviously, I don't know, um, the folks who are here may want to do some follow up on some of these. What are some good resources if people ah, have more questions? Thank you so much for asking. I felt like I talked too long, so I didn't go to my work cited page. <laughs> so I just kind of like, was like, let me just get to questions. Um, so yeah, so when we're talking about the federal um, constitutional convention, the best place to go is James Madison's notes on the debates. Um, because that's him sitting in the room writing everything down, right? Like, so he's taking notes on what happened. The Federalist Papers are another good place to go, but I always caution people because they are propaganda. So the thing about the Federalist Papers, right, is that's trying to get New York to ratify, right? So they are working, writing these op-ed, these essays in an attempt to get New York to ratify. And when I told you the story about New York, you can see why that was a problem, right? Um, so these other scholars, um, and so political historians are kind of where, you know, history and political science mix, right? Um, take a look at letters between people. Um, so from parchment to power and Novus Ordo Seclorum and the Natural Rights Republic looks, so that's what I was saying, Jefferson said to do this, right? So that's not in notes, um, if you will, or like that's not sitting in someone's minute. That is letters you can read going back and forth. I also use that I don't list here as a work cited, but I will pull up. So I like this document. It's probably in reverse, sorry. <laughs> but it's um, the Founders Constitution. And basically what it does is it takes every clause. There's like five giant, art, art, you know, this size book, right? It takes every single clause and shows you all the letters and all the readings. So when I say something like John Locke said this and they were reading it at Yale, that's how I know. Does that make sense? So that you can see them like talking about it. So there's all of that, like personal product, Kim, that generates it. And then in the state conventions and in Congress, they would have taken minutes. Those are public meetings. Um, they would abide by open public meeting laws, kind of the way we do today. And so you can read all of those conversations. Um, and there's some great stuff in those documents. I love I love Madison just being like, could you please talk about, <laughs> we need to talk about this Bill of Rights. And other members going, we have like other things to do. Like, I don't know, pay debts, right? Like there's some important things we need to do. Um, so you can see all of that interchain and that interplay going on there. Thank and you. I think Provost Bibi has a question. Do you want to unmute? Yes, thanks. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Murray. It was really, really exciting, really good to hear that. And as a political historian, I wanted to ask you a question uh, which sort of builds off, off your presentation. So when you talk about the Bill of Rights, you know, the very interesting thing, of course, is how very quickly people start to interpret what those rights actually mean in practice, because it is, of course, a living document. Correct. Uh, in many ways, unlike the other two documents, that, you know, they're not dead documents, but the Bill of Rights in particular, because it affects individuals and their relationship That's to right. one another and their state and their and uh, so I'm interested I'm going to ask you a specific question because it was men that signed this uh you know uh, and I'm interested uh in how what the reaction was if you have any to, to share with the, with the group here uh of women 
and African Americans, particularly uh, about the issues of rights, uh, because of course, these rights were for certain people and not for other people. Yeah. Uh, and you know, you think of someone like Benjamin Banneker, of course, the famous uh, African American uh, uh, man who writes specifically to Thomas Jefferson uh, to ask about the rights of African Americans. Uh, and I'm just, I'm just interested, you know, uh, you know, when you said like a lot of these things were passed with not a lot of discussion, and but they were read very closely by. Uh, men and women, uh, African American men as well, and so I'm just interested how how that very quickly becomes a living document and a place where people push for their rights yeah. uh, as individuals, but also people who are excluded from what it means to be to have those rights. Does, does that make sense? No, it totally does, and I want to be very careful as I say um, that's such a difficult question and Dr. Phoebe if you are a political historian you should maybe answer it and do a better job than I would and I would certainly be good with that um I love how you phrased it um so I'm thinking of you know um Danielle Allen's work so she's got some work on how you read these documents and how close you read these documents and how people who have been excluded can find themselves in the documents right um and I let I think, uh, so go ahead, Dr. Reeves, go ahead, yeah. Well, You're I'm really excited to hear what you have to say, go ahead. Oh, okay, sorry, <laughs> I was like, you turned on your video, so I was gonna let you talk. Um, so I think, I and again, I like how you talked about it is more of a living document than the others. I think um, the constitutional law history, right? So if we're thinking about what is speech and how that how has that evolved and the definitions of what speech, you know, is, and they're totally silent on it. Do you know what I mean? Like I think um, is another way to get after this. In answer to your very specific question, I have not thought about it too much. That's a horrible thing to say for this talk. So the, the story that I'm telling is kind of, how it gets passed, what they're talking about, and to disrupt a narrative, I think sometimes that we have, that the founding fathers were monolithically, do you know what I mean? So the, this, this frame I use is that there is some founding intent. There's not a founding intent, right? Um, and in any moment, we if we disrupt that narrative, we can allow other groups in, right? And then they can start to argue for how the we can correct the absences Right, and we can use the documents to make those corrections. Um, but I can't say that I could specifically say in this letter from. So does that make sense? So um, yeah, I hope that answers your question, but not as specifically maybe as you were looking for. No, it's great. I think you. I think you just for particularly the students on here that uh, you know this is a a living document, and right. uh, it was you know there was a whole series of things behind you know enacting it, uh, and that was and it so it wasn't you know there was no guarantee that this was going to be. In existence and ever right. since its adoption it has been contested right you know what these words mean and that's important you know uh, when we think about citizenship you know what is the role of a citizen in contesting what you know we revere in many ways so right that, that's what i was trying to say so that's a great answer so thank you very much i'll turn my camera on so you could see who who's reacting to your response <laughs> thank you no but thank I, you, dr bb oh yeah no i was just gonna say it was a living document five seconds after they wrote it, right? Like, so you're exactly right, Dr. Beebe. Like this is, um, you know, it's a conversation, right? Among people actively engaged in how um, to govern themselves. Thank you. I think um, Dr. Dolans has a question for you. So I really appreciated the way that that you contextualized the the debates and and the controversy and and some of of the personalities, and it it reminded me a couple of times during your talk that uh, from from time to time I hear about the prospects of a constitutional convention happening in in the world that we live in, and so my question is uh, what it, it, whether you could maybe kind of share your thoughts on. What would it look like if, if we were to see a constitutional convention in these times, given the kind of polarization we're experiencing? What sorts of, of topics do you think would, would be discussed? Do you think we could actually come up with 
uh, constructive solutions to, to any of the problems we face, what would a constitutional convention look like in our current political climate? Well, I love that you asked that because I think very similar to what it looked like then. Right? So regions of the country would have interests. Um, my favorite part of this is when you're looking inside of the states, that the coasts and the cities were supportive and the rural areas were not, right? And this idea that there is absolutely a duality of interest, um, <laughs> you know? And I would argue we've been having that fight for 240 years, right? Like those, those two groups still argue. Um, but I like how you asked the question um, in terms of what we might talk about and what issues. I mean, I think one of the major conversations more recently would be economic choices. So I think in our three original charters of freedom, the declaration, the constitution, and the bill of rights, while property rights are paramount, they discuss everything as political rights. Um, if that makes sense, you know, government intervention in political decisions around, um, you know, speech around religion, around whether you could be drafted around what that, you know, um, whether, uh, you have rights when the government comes to indict you, like what that looks like. And I think in a post 20th century world, right? And you're an economist, so you would know this better than me. We're gonna talk about those economic rights, right? So we would have a conversation about, um, I think a safety net, the, you know, the freedom from want um, conversation that FDR would have introduced in the 1940s. So I think that would be more a part of it. Do you have a right to a universal living wage? Do you have a right to health care? Do you have like, so those economic choices, which I don't think we see, it's much more political set of uh, rights that we're talking about, I think would be there um, in that conversation. Um, and then I think it'd be a free for all. <laughs> we would ratify it by like three votes in a place like Texas, the way we ratified by three votes in a place like New York. Um, it would be interesting to see how, what states would matter, right? You know what I mean? Like what are the big states? What are the wealthy states? Which like, who's the Virginia, Massachusetts and um, New York of this time and thinking about what their interests are. But otherwise I do think we would look very similar in our polarization in the gerrymandering that would go on in an effort to get what we wanted <laughs> in a conversation about, so you said X, I'm just gonna believe it means Y, and then I'm gonna move politically on that, um, I think is what a constitutional convention would look like today. But I tend to not think we're much worse off than we were 240 years ago, Does that, if that makes sense, right? So I feel like, um, we would be feisty and we'd be arguing and there'd been nefarious things going on like there was in Massachusetts um, back in that time. So, but it would be interesting. Thank you, Leah. Um, we have a comment um, okay. from one of our attendees. Um, fantastic presentation, accessible and entertaining. Thank you. Thank you. And there's a two part question. I think you might have just addressed the first part of this, but I'm going to read both pieces of it uh, in case you have more thoughts. How do we as a nation come back together through the Bill of Rights toward issues we are facing today? How important are the Bill of Rights today versus in the past years when these were first voted on? Yeah, so, so I love this. So for James Madison, what you need is something to love. So the way that I talk about this, and I think I ended on it, and maybe it was I was ending kind of fast, but like um, it's about what is the soul of the nation? What is what we care about? And I love how Dr. Beebe talks about it. Like this is the living document because it is about the social contract between people. And it answers the original question of John Locke, <laughs> you know, 400 years ago, how do you, what is this social contract? How do we interact with each other? And it's about people and how they interact with their government. Um, so the way that I think about being brought back together is to be cognizant of the fact that we never really were all that unified in the first place, okay? okay? So there have been major differences among us and between us for a long time. Um, but if we focus on the documents and their corrective nature, um, when I mentioned Danielle Allen earlier, her work is on this corrective component. The fact that the founders built in amend or Article 5 which is an amendment article, right? So they basically said, here's what we're doing. Um, and anytime we got to evolve, evolve it, right? And then the founders in Congress added 12, right? So they were trying to get 12 changes right out of the gate. So 
less, like Madison says, in the minutia, less in the details of any particular policy, more in the striving to be, right? More in the ideal. And what are we as a people? And I think, like I was saying, the Bill of Rights shows us who we are, right? So we are people who takes this stuff very seriously. Congress shall make no law. It's a negative and it's an imperative. It's not a request. You don't get to do this. And it's about the people. And that's, I think, how we make sure we stay connected. Um, and then I think the second part of your question, Kim, read it to me again. I apologize because I feel like I. Okay. Um, how important are the Bill of Rights today versus in past years when these were first voted on? Yeah, so that's a really good question. They're actually much more important today than they used to be. So one thing I didn't do because the Bill of Rights stops at 10 <laughs> um, is talk about the 14th Amendment, um, which comes out in, 18, uh, in the 1860s. So what happens basically is previous to this, if you were a state, and I used, I was talking about Jewish people earlier, who were worried about Jewish people voting, then your state would just not let them vote. And if someone who were Jewish were to litigate, the Supreme Court would rule, well, it says Congress can make no law. It doesn't say South Carolina can't be mean, okay? So a lot of states would kind of do this misbehavior towards groups among itself. When the 14th Amendment comes in, and the 14th Amendment is the equal protection under the law, the Constitution is now going to say it doesn't matter where you are, you are equal under this law. And so states can no longer get away with stuff. And then the Bill of Rights beautifully opens up. Um, and that I would argue and actually is a better answer maybe to Dr. Beebe's first question is when groups that were left out can find themselves, right? And it's when there's enough, disrupt, enough disruptive space um, to be able to use these clauses in this document, right, to fight back. So to a certain extent, it's more important than it was when they wrote it um, because states misbehaved and the 14th Amendment um, puts the Bill of Rights, it's a process called incorporation, puts the Bill of Rights into the states as well. My dog is barking. I love Zoom. Um, <laughs> we have another question here. Let me go up and get it. Um, are there any earlier examples of Bill of Right Bills of Rights? Sure. The English have a Bill of Rights. Um, so when you look at and in fact, one of the conversations is like, even the English have one, right? <laughs> like, so we don't have one, even they have one. Um, and so there's charters, there's examples of charters, right? Um, and I'm tracking English political history because I trace American political history back that way, but you could find charters elsewhere in other cultures. Does that make sense? So absolutely earlier versions um, globally as we start looking at citizenship and what those contracts look like. Um, so early example in England, of course, is the Magna Carta, the English Bill of Rights. Of course, those are more about uh, landowning barons and their relationship with the monarchy than they really are about individuals. Um, but once you get enlightenment, right, once you get this notion of individuals mattering more, that's Locke, right, like those, those kind of arguments, um, there are many more documents that start to lay this out. The other fun thing to do, too, if you're ever kind of bored on a <laughs> like night and you've got time, is you could read the colonial charters. So all of the states were writing constitutions, all the colonies had constitutions, early versions of all of these. So one thing I didn't say at the beginning, but I could have started with is all these men had written dozens of constitutions because when we dissolve our contracts, the first thing we have to do is write state constitutions and they all came from states. So you have all these examples across the country of states and what their bills of rights look like and what they were expecting and what they wanted to see. So all of those also form a context for these framers as well. Thank you. I was hoping he would quiet down, but we may not be lucky. So another question, I'll read it quickly before he disturbs us. Framing new rights as affirmative, people have the right to education, economic security, et cetera, is different from the negative imperative you noted, uh, which says that the government shall not do. How significant yeah. would such a shift be? It would be a very different 
understanding of freedom. Okay, so um, when the framers are writing this, that original Congress, those founders are writing this document, it's a very, it's a negative definition of freedom, which basically is get government out of the way. So negative freedom defined is um, hands off, keep the government out of what's happening and individuals left to their own devices will flourish. But to be fair, they're not, I'm not even sure they really perfectly believe that. If you read the Northwest Ordinance, which is being uh, ratified and at the same time as policy for territories in there, they build in public education, right? So to a certain extent, they kind of actually have some affirmative moves that they make in their policy, but it would be a radical shift to think in a more positive freedom point of, what, of view. So a definition of positive freedom basically says the government gives you education and then you are fully free. The government makes sure you have food and then you're fully free. And how you know it's hard is FDR talked about it in 1941. <laughs> it's like 70 years later and we have not really embraced it. You know what I mean? Like we are still having that argument. Um, so it's a different conversation and a different way of thinking about it. Yeah, it's a good point. So I think that is our last question for this evening. On behalf of Keene State College and the Sador Lecture Series, I would most sincerely like to thank you, Leah, for tonight's presentation. Um, we will have, Leah has graciously allowed us to videotape tonight, so we will have that link available um, if, if folks would like to view this again. But thank you all for joining us and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much.